the African people of, hu of, of whom huge percentage tends to be people from labor, working class people. Um, so the character of that African National Congress and its leaders like Mandela begins to change and the big error that Afrikaans nationalism makes is that it deals with the communists, black or white, and the nationalists, the African nationalists, in the same way. And they repressed and they banned and they house arrested and they imprisoned. Um, so the two come together. I, instead of going for the black-white race um, aspect, let's think of South Africa as having two deep cleavages, that of race, the black-white divide, and that of class, capital and labour. And these two divides, one which gives rise to trade unions, to socialist and the communist party, the other, the race divide or national oppression of black people gives rise to the African nationalism. Under the repression of apartheid and backed up by its courts and jails and judges and of course the brutality of its police and army. So the two cleavages, the divides and those who reflect them come closer together. And I would say that's a period when Mandela casts off his suspicion of the communists and even an element of anti-communism and a tremendous unity emerges in the, the struggle of the 50s, the defiance campaign, defiance of unjust laws. Um, some of similarities with um, the American civil rights movement where blacks and whites volunteers led by Mandela would go and occupy whites only spaces in the post offices, in the railway stations, the park benches, all these um, everyday manifestations of, of, of apartheid. People were thrown into jail and very very seriously, uh, very serious laws were passed, like five years jail sentence for a black man sitting on a white man's bench in a park and vice versa. Ronnie Castro, uh, uh, let me ask this you. Leads to, the, yeah. did, was President Man, did Nelson Mandela become a communist? Well, you know, th this at this particular point in time has become something of an issue because of a book written by uh, a, a British observer called Stephen Ellis. Um, I've just been checking the book again, and I would say that there are pretty strong clues to indicate that for a short period, possibly in the late 50s into the early 60s, that Mandela was very impressed with people like Slovo and Mick Harmel and Ruth First and others. And what I had understood as a young person joining the Communist Party, becoming very close to, to, to uh, Joe Slovo particularly, that people like Walter Sisulu and him, as with Samora Michelle or any leader in the, the African armed struggles, wanted to know what Marxism was about, what, what, what was there from this revolutionary theory um, and, and programs of action that they could learn. So it's a very short period when there is, um, I, I would say, a closing of Mandela's connection, or of it rather perhaps coming about. Um, Mandela, however, has denied it. And I think whatever, there are a couple of people who, who Ellis cites from our movement who say that, well, he was in the Communist Party. There's no documentation. Uh, he certainly became close in that period. But for me, since Mandela has stated many times that he wasn't formally a member, I, I think we've got to accept that. There's, there's no other real conclusive proof. But even if he had been, um, the point is that it was a brief period. Now, as someone in that Communist Party, I, I, I wouldn't make apologies. You know, Sisulu, Mandela, they were great people who joined, like Govan and Becky and Walter uh, and, and Moses Katani. 
but Mandela certainly showed that he was sympathetic, um, he was very full of respect for those communists. The South African Communist Party, said, Ronnie Castro. Ronnie, the South African Communist Party last week said at his arrest in August 62, Nelson Mandela was not only a member of the then underground South African Communist Party, but also a member of our party's central committee. Sure. Communist Party suddenly makes that claim uh, a week or so ago. I was in the party from 1961. I was in the leadership at a very high level in the Central Committee for many years, uh, very close to Slovo and Mabida and others. None of them ever made that claim or statement that he had been a member other than that he had been close and that there had been some educational lessons in Marxism. Now, maybe he had been. It's possible, but there's no document to actually prove that conclusively. So for me, and it's not a question of wanting to cover up or be embarrassed whatsoever, it's that Mandela never acknowledged it. And because there's no real conclusive proof, I think it's got a rest in a sense there, because it doesn't really do very much. The fact is that if Mandela had a Marxist orientation, which he certainly did, I would say, for some time, that was dispelled when he emerges from prison 30 years or so later, where he in immediately, in a major, his first uh, uh, address to our people, he commits himself to the socialist inclined freedom charter and the clause that is quite emphatic, although it doesn't use the word nationalization, but says that uh, what we committed to is the control of the hearts of the economy, the mines, the banks, the monopoly industry, and it's inconceivable that that will change. Right. Two years later, he shows a totally different view on the economy by going to Davos, 1992, July, very impressed, clearly, as he was in South Africa, by the voice of Monopoly Capital. Uh, I'm not saying he bows down to it, but he's certainly impressed in terms of what they're able to do, and comes back from Davos and says that for growth of the economy, we've got to look to the private sector. And he says that it's clear that if we go for radical socialist approach, he uses the term nationalization, we're not going to get the foreign investment from the capitalist world that we need to, to make the country run and to overcome our poverty.